Our next speaker is Miranda Levy. She is a training and information specialist for the Northwest ADA Center. Miranda holds an MA degree in rehabilitation counseling from Western Washington University, is a certified rehabilitation counselor, and a certified ADA coordinator. As a training and information specialist, Miranda provides technical assistance via phone and email, and frequently performs in-person and web-based trainings on ADA-related topics, such as service animals, reasonable accommodations, disability etiquette, and more. She also maintains the Northwest ADA Center's social media presence and website, maintains the Northwest ADA Center's webinar program. Miranda is heavily involved with a variety of ADA national network committees and work group activities as well. Over the past decade, Miranda has become increasingly involved with the disability community through volunteer projects with the Epilepsy Foundation Northwest and is on the state of Washington's Office of Secretary of State Elections Division Disability Advisory Committee. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Welcome, Miranda. <laughs> Thank you, Kira, and uh, thank you everybody for being here. I'm very excited for this opportunity. So uh, happy uh, Epilepsy Awareness Month, and I hope last month you all had a happy uh, National Disability Employment Awareness Month, given my uh, topic, right? So today we're gonna be talking about employment rights and responsibilities under the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I will kind of outline that in a couple of minutes. But uh, first, I have to give my little spiel um, about who I am. Kira gave you uh, my bio, so I don't need to talk about that. Embarrassing. Um, I do work at the Northwest ADA Center. I do technical assistance, as Kira mentioned, trainings like this one. That's me. I send out information via phone and email. Do research projects. We are just starting one on accessible health care. And public awareness events like vendor tables. That's me again. Actually, that's me at last year's epilepsy conference, actually. Yeah. Um, the ADA Center is part of the Center for Continuing Education and Rehabilitation. We're actually affiliated with the University of Washington. And we're grant funded by Nidler. We just got refunded for our next five years. Yay. Thank you. Yay, yay, yay. And we're part of the ADA National Network. So today, our learning goals. Uh, we're going to learn what is a reasonable accommodation. Uh, we're going to discuss what employers can ask employees about disabilities throughout the employment process. And we're going to walk through the steps of the interactive process, including disclosure. Um, just a couple of quick things. Uh, because we are kind of short on time here, I'm going to ask to keep questions till the end of this presentation, but then I'm happy to take some questions. And I am going to be reading the slides for maximum accessibility, and I know some people find that boring, but uh, too bad. <laughs> I'm doing it anyway. So the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, there are five titles. Uh, title I, employment. Title II, state and local government, so like courthouses, uh, colleges, et cetera. Title III, places of public accommodation, grocery stores, restaurants, hotels. Title IV, telecommunications. And uh, Title V, miscellaneous provisions, so saying that a uh, person uh, can't be retaliated against if they filed a complaint. And today, we're going to be focusing on Title I, employment. So what is a reasonable accommodation? Sorry, I'm going to pull this up a little bit. A reasonable accommodation is any modification or adjustment to the application or hiring process, to the job and employment practice, or the work environment that allows a qualified individual with a disability to perform the essential functions of the job and enjoy equal opportunity in the workplace. So that's kind of the quoted definition from the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And that's basically saying, um, excuse me, um, that 
given a reasonable accommodation in the workplace, a person with a disability is able to do their job the same as a person who does not have a disability. They just need a little bump. It's equal access, which is the whole point of the Americans with Disabilities Act, right? Now, what can employers ask about disabilities and when can they ask those? Because there are multiple phases in the employment process, right? During the application process, there is this voluntary, do you have a disability checkbox? And probably most, if not all of you, have seen this uh, on an application, okay? Uh, in some states, they've eliminated this, do you have a disability checkbox, so you wouldn't even see this. In Washington State, we still do have this checkbox. And it's completely voluntary, like I said. It's the same as uh, where it says, uh, are you a veteran, what is your gender, et cetera. They can't force you to disclose whether you have a disability, but you can. Sometimes it may be beneficial for you to check that box. Um, certain circumstances, I'm not going to delve into that too much right now, um, but make your choice. It's completely, completely optional, completely personal decision. During the interview process, if you've been called for an interview, no disability-related questions may be asked, whether you have an apparent or non-apparent disability. All right? Now, there's a caveat to this. An interviewer may ask somebody to perform a task about the disability if they have a concern that a person maybe would not be able to for perform um, an uh, essential function of the job. So say that um, a person comes in and uh, they have quadriplesis and an essential function of the job, as it states on the, um, you see it on the job application, right? Um, is to say lift 300 pounds, 300 pound boulders or something like that, okay? Um, and you see this person, he, he comes in and, and uh, he has, he's quadriplegic. And so they say, all right, you know, we're interviewing you, we're asking you questions, why do you want this job, why are you perfect for this job, et cetera. Now, um, we're gonna have to have you demonstrate how you could lift a 300 pound boulder. You don't mention, we don't think you can do it because you are quadriplegic. Just say, we need you to demonstrate that. Now, they need to ask all people that they are interviewing to do that. And, but obviously, their concern is we think that this person, because they cannot move from the neck down, but they can do that. They would ask me that because, huh, do I look like I can move a 300 pound boulder? I don't think so. I weigh 95 pounds. <laughs> Heck no. Um, <laughs> but so there's that little caveat there. Now, this is the gray area. The post-conditional job offer. Disability-related questions may be asked and medical exams consistent with business necessity may be required. Job offers may not be rescinded solely based on answers. So once somebody has offered you the job, they can say, all right, we're asking, we, can, we want you to have this job, but first, we want you to take a medical exam, get signed off from a doctor saying that you can have this job. Uh, we need you to take a drug test, um, and we want to ask you some questions. And again, this would be a requirement for all people that they would potentially hire for a job at that company. And again, if they found out based on the medical exams, based on some questions that they asked the person, that the person has a disability, and the person can still do the job if the physician signed off, said fit for duty, et cetera, and then they rescinded the job, they can't do that, right? Only if they found out based on those questions, based on if the physician said, oh, no, they cannot do that job, et cetera, only then could they rescind the job, okay? Now, they passed the exams, et cetera, the person gets employed. No disability-related questions may be asked. Again, all disability and accommodation information goes in a separate accommodation file, all right? So if a person asks for reasonable accommodation, 
we'll talk about accommodations in further detail in a minute. But, and you go through that interactive process, all of that, none of that goes into a personnel file. All of that is in a separate confidential file. It never follows that person to a different job, even if they work in the same entity. So I work at University of Washington, for example. I work um, in Department of Rehab Medicine. If I move over and work in, in human resources, they don't know anything about the reasonable accommodations that I get because this, it's in my confidential file. It's not in my personnel file, right? And if they talk to me, they know that I have a disability at my work. Um, and so they're looking at me and they're thinking, oh, you know, maybe I want to talk to her about her disability. Maybe she needs some accommodations or maybe I just want to see how she's doing. No, that's, that's the person with the disability's responsibility, right? And I'm gonna emphasize this several times because it's very important. When can accommodation requests be made? I get this question a lot. Employees or potential employees may request accommodations at any time throughout the application, hiring, or employment process, okay? So a person can call up, uh, you know, applications now, they're always online, all the time online, and say a person says, I have a learning disability, uh, it takes me too long to fill out this online application, it keeps canceling out, uh, I need a, a paper application, can I come in and get one of those? Okay, sure, you can do that on the application process. Um, or they can be hired, they can be employed, they can be there for 27 years and they can go in and say, I have a disability, I need um, a reasonable accommodation now. And the employer goes, well, you've been here for 27 years, you can't ask for accommodation now. Yes, you can. Either because they've had an age-acquired disability, they just got in an accident and now they need a, dis uh, a reasonable accommodation, or maybe they just only found out that they can ask for an accommodation. Who knows? It doesn't matter. You can ask any time, right? Does that make sense to everybody, right? Now there are definitely employee responsibilities here. There, there are responsibilities on both sides of the table. The process for re requesting a reasonable accommodation must be initiated by the employee who has a disability. And disclosure in this case is required. So requests must be made verbally or on paper. Some businesses, though, have a specific process, such as a form that employees have to fill out. So again, I'll use the example of University of Washington, because I do work there. Um, I could go in to my boss and say, I need a reasonable accommodation. And he'll say, all right, I think there's some form you need to fill out, uh, check out the website. Uh, they say, all right, yeah, fill out one, one page form. I fill it out, they said we don't have enough information, you have to fill out this nine page form. It actually is, it's nine pages. So that's how that works because it's, you know, it's University of Washington, there's a lot of red tape. Um, <laughs> other places they don't care so much and you just talk to someone verbally. My suggestion though, um, do everything on paper. Keep everything on paper, keep copies for yourself. Um, but like I said, uh, this is the only time that disclosure is required. And it is required, because how can they give you an accommodation if they don't know that you have a disability, right? Provide documentation of the need for the accommodation if it is requested. And that's if the need for the accommodation is not obvious, right? Um, if you are blind, you use a cane, you go into someone's office and you say, I need screen reading software because I, I can't see my computer because I'm blind. Um, they can't very well say, well, I need a note from your doctor because I, I'm not sure that you really are blind. No, <laughs> they couldn't ask for that. Uh, if you have a seizure disorder and you're asking for accommodation, that would be pretty reasonable for them to ask for some, uh, some notes, some, somebody to confirm that because that's a non-apparent disability, right? A person with a seizure disorder does not have epilepsy sticker on their forehead, usually. I've not seen that yet. So <laughs> I, I personally don't wear that. So, so and, and you don't need to give them your whole medical history. You just need a note, some form. Again, they may have a, a specific form for somebody to fill out, but, um, but just a little bit of documentation. And 
again, the responsibility, the person needs to be involved in the process of identifying the effective accommodation. So the employee goes in, talks to probably the human resources person, if there is one, or their empl direct employer, or whoever is in charge of accommodations, says, this is the accommodation that I want. Um, I, I, I think I'm skipping ahead of myself. Um, so, okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna back up. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, let's talk about disclosure, because I've totally gotten ahead. Um, we'll talk about disclosure. So, st disclosure, step one in the reasonable accommodation process, like I said, not required by law. Exception um, is to obtain the reasonable accommodation and you may disclose at any time throughout the application, hiring, or employment process, which is, again, I said I'm gonna emphasize this a whole bunch of times, um, <laughs> because you can, right? And I said, I, I get this question all the time. You, don't, you can be working somewhere for 30 years and never tell them that you have a disability, even though you've had the same disability for 30 years, and you just never needed an accommodation for it. Maybe you've been hard of hearing, for 30 years, but it, it's sort of been okay. But then as you've aged, maybe it's gotten worse to the point where, okay, yeah, you need, you need some accommodation or something like that. Now let's talk about the interactive process, all right, which I was starting to get into. After the employee has made a request to his or her employer for a reasonable accommodation, the employer and the employee, or the HR person or whomever, should engage in an informal interactive process to determine the best accommodation for that person. And what you call an effective accommodation would remove a workplace barrier, thereby providing the individual with an equal opportunity to apply for a position, to perform the essential function of a position, or to gain equal access to a benefit or privilege of employment. Again, that's what the EEOC calls it quoted definition, and again, that's sort of what I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, right? So the person can have equal access to effective employment. So they have equal access to the opportunity to get a job, just like anybody else, right? Now the employer actually may choose among reasonable accommodations as long as the choice is effective. So the employee goes into the office of HR or the employer and they have their idea of what kind of accommodation they want. So say this person, they have epilepsy and they go in and they say, I have a disability, it would be easiest for me if I could do my job, if I could telework, um, you know, five days a week. Um, that would be easiest for me given my disability. And um, the employer goes, you know what, um, I'd like to help you out but Given uh, the structure of our workplace, we cannot do that for you. Um, however, this is one that we could do for you. They have to offer another accommodation, an alternative accommodation that is equal or better for that person. What I suggest to people with disabilities is that they usually have their own backup accommodation that they can suggest that they really want, all right? Um, if they don't have another thought in their mind, Again, they need to be there, be able to negotiate and to know how to negotiate with that person. So again, the employer may choose, but they have to be able to offer um, something equal or better. Like I said here, the employer may offer alternative suggestions and it needs to be equally effective. The employer may require medical documentation if the need for the accommodation is not readily apparent like I talked about before. There are some times when um, the employer may not be obligated to provide a reasonable accommodation. So there's two circumstances, undue hardship. When an accommodation is expensive, difficult, disruptive to the work environment or will fundamentally change the nature of the position. So for example, um, if, uh, let me see, I, uh, I had a call recently where somebody was taking extended leave uh, due to their disability and they said, okay, well, I'm gonna be out for a week because of my disability. And so it's a very, very small medical office. And um, then they called and they said, oh, okay, never mind. I'm, I'm taking another 
four weeks and then they call again and they say okay well now I just don't know how long I'm going to be out again so they keep asking this for accommodation and meanwhile the like two other staff people that are in the office are covering the job duties of that person um, and as well as doing their other work uh, so that is fundamentally changing um, or, it's, or excuse me it's disrupting the work environment because these other staff members are covering that person's work um, this whole time for a very extended period of time and the patients in this clinic um, were not being taken care of. So if, for, if this was for a couple of days, okay, fine, but if it's going on for weeks and weeks and weeks and now for an indeterminate amount of time, they were able to say, okay, I'm sorry, we cannot cover you anymore, we cannot provide this accommodation. Now, direct threat, a significant risk of threat to the safety of the employee or others that cannot be eliminated or lessened by reasonable accommodation, meaning the harm must be serious and likely to occur, not remote or speculative. This is what the EEOC says. And I actually get a lot of questions regarding people with seizure disorders um, and direct threat because it's, it's a little confusing. So, for example, I'll get calls like, um, well, I just hired someone um, to work in my shop, like an industrial kind of job, and, and then right after I hired him, he told me that he has seizure disorder and he climbs ladders a lot. Is that direct threat? Uh, can I let him go or something like that? Or, you know, and I said, well, I, you know, because now he says, uh, can I make, you know, accommodation to not climb ladders or something like that? Well, maybe. I mean, if it's not an essential function of his job to climb ladders, can he do his job to not climb ladders? Maybe. If he does not need to climb jet ladders for his job, if it is completely necessary for him to do his job, um, he maybe does not need to be there. Um, but it's po and. If, but if he, if you're taking him away from the ladders and other people are needing to do part of his job, um, again, then we get back to the undue hardship situation. It's a very tricky situation. I had another call from somebody, again, it was some kind of industrial work. Uh, they had just hired somebody, I think it was like an electrician internship. The guy uh, had just hired him. He had a seizure on the job. Turns out part of his job was driving a truck. Um, and he goes, yeah, he's actually right out driving right now. And I said, well, um, all right, well, you know, think about that. <laughs> he, uh, well, uh, we talked about various reasonable accommodation situations, and he said, yeah, well, you know, do we need to accommodate him? And, and he said, uh, can we, should we accommodate him for, um, to not drive the truck? And I said, well, is it an essential function of his job? And he, he said, yes. And I said, well, okay. Um, again, you, you think about that. So he's not obligated to, to provide that accommodation. He can. Employers can do whatever they want, but he does not have that obligation. I'm just giving those examples for seizure disorders because they can be very complicated, and they certainly can be a direct threat. And I, you know, I don't, I don't like to say those kind of things, but it is true. So here's some types of reasonable accommodations for people who have seizure disorders. I'm obviously giving those specific examples because we are here. Um, telework, of course, much easier because no transportation situation. Um, providing information on paper, um, sort of like our previous speaker was talking about, much easier um, for memory situations. Uh, we've talked about how memory um, is increased once things are written down, right? Providing transportation or facilitating carpools um, from the office, uh, uh, other people in the office or something like that. Allowing flex schedules. So say if somebody has a seizure at some point during the day, uh, then uh, you allow them to change their schedule a little, little bit if they don't feel well or if they need to go to doctor's appointments, something like that. Um, and that can be with lots of disabilities, of course. Um, allowing extended breaks as needed. So for example, again, if somebody has a seizure during the day and they need to take a little break afterwards, they get a longer break than somebody might. 
and then reassigning to a vacant position, which is what we always say for any type of reasonable accommodation list. That's usually your last resort accommodation. If we talk about all types of reasonable accommodations, well, I want this one. Well, how about this one, this one, this one? That's sort of your last resort, okay. We can't think of a possible reasonable accommodation for this person. We might just need to move you to some other uh, position if one is open, okay. There is no need for an employer to actually create a position for an employee. Uh, if there is one open, they do not need to move them to a higher position, a higher paid position, or to promote them. They can, but they do not, they're not obligated to. Just some quick facts um, about accommodations. I, I mentioned this because uh, when I'm talking to people who have disabilities or advocates or what have you, their arguments that people use, and employers. Uh, over 70% of employees with disabilities never request an accommodation, actually. The cost effectiveness, 58% of employers report cost data um, paid nothing for accommodations. Uh, like think of like telework, doesn't cost anything. <coughs> Flex hours, nothing. 74% of employers report that accommodations are effective. This is information from the Job Accommodation Network, JAN. More about that, uh, the cost of job accommodations. Uh, employers report no cost or low cost. And of those that did have a cost, the typical one-time expenditure was $500. So you can see this here. 58% um, had no cost. 36% had a one-time cost. 4% had an ongoing annual cost and only 1% had a combination one time and annual cost. And again, that's from the Job Accommodation Network. So if you wanna have a little more information um, on reasonable accommodation information and ideas, a very good resource if you're not familiar with it is the Job Accommodation Network, JAN. Uh, the website is askjan.org and they can be reached at 800-526-7234. They do have a live person there. They're on the East Coast, though, so you have to get them, um, you know, before three hours ahead of us. Um, they're fantastic. Their website is great because you can just go, you can search, for example, seizure disorder, epilepsy, whatever, and they will have a huge amount of documents, PowerPoints, et cetera, with, like, a list of examples of reasonable accommodations for people with epilepsy, for example, or any other disability. Uh, other information uh, for ADA employment information. We talked about the EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Um, they're found at eeoc.gov, and you can call them at 800-669-4000. And of course, the Northwest ADA Center, where I work, uh, at nwadacenter.org, or you can call us at 800-949-4232. Uh, you can ask for me, Miranda. And we have a few other people there as well. And we're on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Yeah. It's me right there. Wait, my thing isn't working now. Well, you can see me. I'm in the front. So again, if you want to contact me, we have the toll-free line. You can email the general email, although it comes to me anyway. Um, <laughs> the website I just gave you. And you can email me directly at levym at uw.edu. And uh, all right, so I'd sort of breeze through that. Does anyone have any other questions? Okay, so I'm just into real case scenarios. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so my daughter, as people heard before, just got diagnosed with epilepsy three months before going to college. Now's at the University of Washington, lives in a sorority, mm. has already had a seizure. That was exciting at the sorority on the porch. But that said, she wants to be a physician assistant mm -hmm. or something like that. She's already a certified nursing assistant that she got that license before she had epilepsy. But now every time she goes for a job interview, they ask, do you have epilepsy on the application, like at the hospital? So she doesn't check the box because we don't know what to do. And it just seems like she wants to like be a physician assistant. Well, there's 53 chosen every year. There's 1,200 applicants. And you're telling me that they see that she has epilepsy and there's 1,200 great applicants and there's 53 spots that she's not going to be. Yeah, and, and we can't prove it. 
So I just, this is her passion. She's a biology major. I don't know what she's gonna be, who knows, it's too early, that's just her passion right now. But I'm really concerned because I'm like, I can't, I, she went to the neurologist, he's like, you can't be an astronaut, you can't be a pilot, you can't be a long-term truck driver, but you can be a PA, you can be a doctor, you can be anything you want. You can't, be a, you can't scuba dive. He told her the things she cannot do. But I still, in the back of my mind, I'm like, how, when every, how does she, they take care of patients. Yeah. I mean, how, how, why don't they have a direct threat to not hire her? Yeah, so, and this is a required question on the form. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. And so you say you don't have to check that box. It's voluntary until this interview. Or wait, until the post. Yeah. Yeah. Um. That. Yeah. That's interesting. It does, and especially for like federal jobs, this is what I was not going to get into because federal agencies are trying to like bump up their statistics of people with disabilities. But I think what they're looking, well, I mean, who knows? I can't make assumptions on this, but it's a very specific scenario and a little. Mm. Well, th yeah. Yeah. No, I know. Um, yeah. No, I know. I mean, I'm... No, not appropriate. Um, yeah, well... Yeah. No, it's not good. Um, I can think of some ways to address that. Uh, it's, oh, it's almost a legal situation. Um, let's talk about that a little bit afterwards. Um, yeah, no, that, that's mm, not appropriate. Um, from, from what I'm hearing from you, it should not be like that. Um, I think there was this guy over here. The ABA rules change depending on the size of the company. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, do the ADA rules change on the si depending on the size of the company? They do. So um, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the federal law, um, employers are required to provide um, accommodations if they have 15 or more employees. In Washington state, businesses are required to provide accommodations if they have eight or more employees, all right? Um, so it, 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 there are differences in the state. Um, in Oregon, it's six or more. In uh, Alaska, you only have to have one or more employee. So it, it, you know, you can do some research on your state, or if you give me a call, I can, I can look into it if you're from somewhere else. Kevin? Yeah, I'm in the back. Um, so many, many, many years ago, I was in a job that I was eligible for an internal promotion that would have required me to drive um, to visit clients and so on. And it was only maybe two or three days a week that it would have had. But my, should my, should have my employer, should they have provided me with an accommodation such as paying for a taxi for me to get to visit clients, or were they justified in kind of looking the other way, which is basically what they did? Um, so um, employers are not required to provide transportation as a reasonable accommodation. They can if they would like to, um, but that is not an accommodation that they necessarily need to. Um, what I have when, when it is an essential function of your job, like I've talked to a couple of people when I see transportation as an essential function of the job. I've, I've talked to a couple people when I've looked into applying for jobs and I've said, you know, I see this on the, uh, the job and, and I'm not able to drive myself um, due to a disability, but I can think of, you know, some other means that I could 
visit clients or whatever. And they said, okay, yeah, it sounds like you're really qualified. Um, if you can come in, talk to us and tell us how you'd be able to come to these meetings or, or whatever, um, then that would be fine. But they, they wouldn't necessarily need to say reimburse you per se, but you could certainly ask. I have that accommodation. They reimburse me at my work, but it, it's, they don't have that obligation. Just want to make sure I didn't miss out on an opportunity to sue him. That's all. <laughs> and mind you, I am not giving legal advice. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not allowed to do that. I'm not an attorney. Kira, um, you make a reasonable accommodation agreement with your employer. If it turns out not to work, is it always like? renegotiable can you always go back and talk to them about adjusting the accommodations absolutely um you can always say i don't need this anymore because you could have a temporary disability or it changes you can ask for more accommodations um yeah i mean absolutely it's you know it's a could be a contract per se not telling you legally um <laughs> but yeah absolutely it, things can change maybe it doesn't work out who knows absolutely Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. A hundred percent true. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent true. And most people who who do have seizures can drive. So you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, yeah. Any any other questions, or does anyone else need any clarification? I know I kind of dumped all this information on you. Yes. So she said um, uh, having cognitive interpreters, um, the ADA says something about having cognitive interpreters in court. Yes. So, um, yeah, so if you had somebody um, like a, a job specialist or something like that assisting somebody in the workplace, um, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, a job coach, for example. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, technically. Usually um, what it would be is that somebody, you know, like if, if somebody was working with uh, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation or a CRP or something like that, a um, uh, uh, job coach for someone with an intellectual disability or a significant learning disability um, would be provided a job coach in the workplace by that agency that probably wouldn't be provided by the employer. Um, so it wouldn't even need to really be a reasonable accommodation provided by the employer because they would just have the obligation to allow that job coach in the workplace. It would just kind of be saying, look, you're hiring this person and this other this job coach is coming with them. That's just how it is. legal assistance yeah. um yeah so um so if you wanted some more legal resources or if you wanted to file a complaint or something like that um on my website we have a list of low income and pro bono resources um for all the states that i cover washington oregon idaho and alaska if you also want some other resources um uh to like employment related you would got, talk to Federally, you talk to the EEOC or any other situation, you would talk to the Department of Justice. If it's housing related, you would talk to um, Housing and Urban Development. Um, but that's a combination of the Fair Housing Act and the ADA. 
Um, what I would suggest a person do first, though, is talk to your state human rights commission. So in Washington State, that would be the Washington State Human Rights Commission. Um, and then our surrounding states have uh, equivalent. So like in Oregon, it's Bureau of Labor Industries. Idaho has the um, Idaho uh, Commission for Human Rights. Alaska has the Alaska State Human Rights Commission, et cetera. And I can assist you with finding those resources if you like. They, they can provide you legal resources. They can assist you with filing a state complaint. Uh, the reason I say to start local is because they, of course, get much fewer complaints than the federal agencies, of course, first. If they find your situation has merit, they'll investigate it, and then they will kick it up to the federal agency if, if they feel like it's a big situation. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a really tricky situation. I ask people that a lot if they're in a union, and, you know, sometimes people say, oh, yeah, I am, you know, and, and they're excited about that. Yeah, talk to my union rep, and other people will say, oh, God, my union rep, because, you know, sometimes the union rep can be extremely helpful, and they can be an advocate with them, say, in the interactive process, because I really encourage people to always bring a third party in with them when they're going through this interactive process so they can focus on the meeting while they're talking with their boss or their HR person and the other person can take notes like their union rep or their spouse or partner or something like that. You can absolutely bring a third party in with you despite what anyone might tell them. But sometimes the union rep or the union in general is does not work for the, and, and you know this or whoever's in a union, sometimes the union does not work for um, the employee, right? They work for the business. Um, so yes, this is a very unfortunate circumstance, but yeah, you do need to take those steps. I'm not taking any political stance here. I'm just <laughs> stating. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? So like I said, um, if you have any other questions or situations, feel free to come talk to me after, or you can absolutely give me a call or shoot me an email. Right. Thank you very much.